You're calling me over You're pulling me close With love you surround me You give me hope Now today we are going to take time as you can see here in the front that um, to I know in just a second Why does everyone remind me of Children's Church? We just did a baby dedication I know we got kids this is for everyone's sake. We are going to take time to remember the Lord's Supper today. Okay, and I've asked several gentlemen if they could help me. Um, Ron and Harmon, I, I won't be needing you as I thought. I may need you later on this evening or, or possibly the next time around, but I just wanted to let you know that way we didn't have like 20 guys coming up. So yes, now Children's Church may go join <laughs> Children's Church may go. <laughs> I'm going to start doing it on purpose. Come on, kids, let's get out of here. <laughs> Bye, kids. No, I am, I am thankful for Joyce and the team that help out with our children's church, and I'm glad that we have kids to go to children's church. That's, that's exciting. That's a good thing. Yes, you can clap for that. It's a great thing. And I'm also glad that Joyce gets my sense of humor, and I know sometimes I razz her from up here, but that's just because I have a platform to do it with. Believe me, she can do it just as bad sometimes. So um, that's, that's what I love about her, and she really is doing a great job, and so is the rest of the team. We, um, we're looking at resuming some Sunday school things and everything, so if you know of kids who are needing to get plugged into church, we have great opportunities here at CBC, and we have opportunities for you too. So we're glad that you guys are here, but let's open up our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to be going into Colossians chapter 4 as well. But we're going to start off in chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 18. But as you turn there, um, I would like to know, how many of you have heard the name Lee Strobel? Lee Strobel. You heard it this morning. Thank you, Harmon. <laughs> All right, so just like, well, you guys did better than the last service. The last service I asked how many people know who Lee Strobel is, and one lady raised her hand. I went, oh, Lord. Oh, we're going to have to work on this because I'm going to have to explain everything. But it's okay. A few of you know who Lee Strobel is. If you don't, you'll know him by the end of this. It's all right if you don't know who Lee Strobel is. But uh, how many of you ha might have seen the movie, heard about the books, Case for Christ? Okay, that's a little better. I'm glad about that. That's a little bit better. So Lee Strobel was an award-winning author and a legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. And kind of the gist of his story is that he set out to disprove Christ and in reality proved Christ. Does that sound familiar? Oh, okay. Whoa. Good. Whew, good. It's kind of difficult when you're up here preaching and the whole room doesn't get your illustration whatsoever. You're like... Oh. Well, Lord, <laughs> it's your word, not mine. We'll let you go with it. But Lee Strobel, the reason that I bring him up is that you see this drastic change in his life where he went from this Im immoral drunkard who was unashamedly an atheist, just, I hate God and if there, if there is a God, but I really don't believe that there is a God. And he just was totally against Christianity, he thought they were ridiculous, but now he's come to this point where in proving Christ, when he tried to disprove, using all those investigative skills, he wrote several different books. Uh, you have Case for Christ, Case for Faith, Case for Creation. Uh, I think a new one's coming out called Case for Grace, where he takes those investigative skills and pours it into those books, video series, a movie that made it into theaters and on Netflix and everything. Um, it's a fantastic movie, by the way. I know a lot of Christian movies don't meet that Hollywood standard. And you're like, who hired these actors? Um, but this one did. This one was a phenomenal movie, Case for Christ. He did all of that, and he's sharing that information with the rest of the world so that they might be able to know who Christ is. And it changed all of his relationships. But there was a couple different interviews that I'd like to draw from. Uh, in one of them, they were talking to him, and they said this, although he was an award-winning journalist for the Chicago Tribune, he had a mess of a life, saying that his younger daughter feared his arrival arrival home from work. That's a different man than what he is today. 
When his wife, Leslie, was befriended by a Christian woman in their condo building and made a decision to accept Christ, Strobel wasn't impressed but figured he had nothing to lose in accompanying Leslie to church one Sunday. Lee also described his wife, just so you know. In this interview, they talk about, well, he said he had nothing to lose by going to church with his wife. But in a separate interview, in a face-to-face one, he says, when my wife came back and I started to see how she acted around my family, her life was totally different. Her demeanor had changed. The way she treated me had changed. And he, he uses these two words, and I want you to remember them. When he looked at her life, he said it was winsome and attractive. And it made him want to check things out for himself. And so in doing that, of course, as I said, he went to church one Sunday with her and he heard a sermon about basic Christianity. And in hearing that sermon, he has this to say, if this stuff is true, he told himself, it has huge implications for my life. He, he saw there was something, and it sparked his interest. And so taking the skills that he learned at the Chicago Tribune, because in order to be an award-winning author and a legal editor, you got to know how to investigate things and find facts, correct? You, you don't get there just by throwing something together. And so he takes those skills and says, I will put them toward proving or disproving Christ, because if it is true, i got to make some changes. But if it's not, then I can rest assured I'm okay the way that I am. And in doing that, he finds Christ and comes to know him. And most people just focus on that part of the story. Well, Lee's the guy who investigated, tried to disprove Christ, ended up proving Christ. And they leave out everything else. But you know, the, there's key components to his story. Do you see what happened? A lady who was a Christian befriended his wife. And then his wife, having been changed and made new by Jesus Christ now starts to reflect Christ in her relationship with her husband, and it makes him go, this is kind of attractive. This is something that I might want to check out for myself. So he goes to church, and while his wife may not have been the one to sit there, I don't know if she was the one to sit there and pray with him or actually lead him to the Lord, she helped lead him to the Lord by her actions, her words, by showing and reflecting Christ in their relationship. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. When I am made new and I place my faith in Christ, it doesn't just affect the individual. I start reflecting Christ in every relationship, whether it's with my spouse, my family, my friends, anyone whatsoever. Paul's going to let us know about that. Anyone who's out there, it should reflect in that relationship and the way that you talk to them. And it's going to have a purpose because you have no idea who the next Lee Strobel might be. You have no idea who the next Billy Graham might be. Even if they're not a Billy Graham or a Lee Strobel, do you know that when one person returns to the Lord, angels cry out praises to his name? That's incredible. And so we need to make sure that we're willing to reflect that in our lives. If we are made new in Christ, we need to live new in every aspect. And so what Paul does today is kind of similar to what he did when he talked about other philosophies. Do you remember us talking about that a couple weeks ago? And he kind of pinpoints different problems and different influences that are attacking the church right at that moment. And they're baby Christians, so he's trying to protect them from those outside influences that would take them away from God. And rather than name every single philosophy that's out there, Paul listens to Epaphras who's written to him and hears certain issues that are happening and addresses those specifically. And just like here, you'll see him address specific things and that's kind of our clue that that might be an issue or a way that Paul is trying to tell them be different from the world. Okay, he doesn't address every single relationship. But let's go ahead and read, starting in verse 18. Here you go, Barbara. (laughs) Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. (laughs) I've been waiting for that one. I've been waiting for that one. We'll talk about that in just a second, but I, oh man, today's the day. Uh, Husbands, oh Ed, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. 
Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for those that God may open, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should act wisely toward outsiders making the most of the time let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how you should answer each person this passage right here can be a little bit convicting especially when we get to the part about gracious speech It's a little hard sometimes to let it be seasoned with salt and with grace at the same time because we live in a world where we kind of want to get the, oh man, I got him. You know what I mean? You know the got him phrases where you just know I stuck it to him, I did it, all right. And we want to be that way, but we're going to get to that portion in just a second where we've got to kind of own up to some of the things, be ready to make some changes. But I want to encourage you, there is hope. Everybody understand? Okay. Not everybody understands, that's okay. The two in the front row understand. All right, let's go back as we typically do. Let's break this down. Let's look at the kinds of relationships that Paul's talking about saying, you must reflect Christ in these relationships. And I know I tease Ed and Barbara, but I know they love each other and I love them dearly. So guests, please don't run away and go, well, geez, he'll point me out in my relationship. (laughs) Nope, just Ed and Barbara. But we're going to look at these relationships, and yes, the first one that we look at is a spousal relationship. Verse 18 and 19, first he talks to the wives and says, Submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. And then husbands, love your wives, and don't be bitter toward them. This is not the first time nor the last time that Paul talks about what a godly relationship should look like. What that godly marriage should look like. But this is one of those verses where people take it out of context. And if you were one of those husbands that just nudged your wife, be careful. And if you were one of those wives that just nudged your husband, be careful, okay? This is not one of those verses, men, where we can take it. And if our wife disagrees with us on an issue, go, well, you just need to submit. Guarantee you, you'll come to church with a black eye. Just saying, just saying, and I'm not going to be the one to throw a T-bone at you and say, put some ice on it. I'm going to be the guy that said, told you so, all right? But these spousal relationships, it looks like, man, the wife is just supposed to be domineering over the woman and that she's not supposed to have a say in anything whatsoever. That's, there's nothing that that woman can do. She's supposed to be a slave to that man. And then on the flip side, it looks like that husband is just supposed to dote over his wife and give her absolutely everything, even if she doesn't need it whatsoever. What this is truly showing is that there are separate roles, which is different than one above the other. Because here in verse 25, Paul just got done saying, there is no what? Favoritism. There is no favoritism. Do you know who Jesus died for? All. For God so loved the world. That means everyone, both male, female, Gentile, Jew, red and yellow, black and white, we are precious in his sight. That is what that means. And so if I am a child of God because I've placed my faith and I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, then my wife as well, who has placed her faith in Christ, is a child of God. We are one. And then when I get married to her, we become one flesh. Because back in Genesis, it says that a a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's leave and cleave. That's what that is. We are one in the Lord, but there are separate roles. I have to take on that responsibility of being one of the spiritual heads of the household. 
I should be the one helping to make those decisions that are going to edify my wife and my family. If I love her the way that Christ loves the church, then she's going to grow in her walk with him and we should grow closer together. It's not me taking the whip and going, go, come on, get to work, go do laundry, go work in the kitchen, go. Yeah, those are all things that get you killed. <laughs> but at the same time, my wife takes on a separate role and she has that desire in her to love me the way that God has called her to love me. And there were times, I know we've only been married, it's two years in August, so uh, in the latter part of August, August, but in our very, very, very beginning of our relationship, my wife was working full time, I was working full time, but yet she desired to love me in such a way where I wouldn't have to do laundry, I wouldn't have to cook, I wouldn't have to clean, and when the house started falling apart just a touch, I mean like a grain of dirt right there, she would feel like I'm not the wife, I'm not, the, I'm not, I'm not doing what I should be doing, I'm supposed to, and I'd have to say, honey, honey, honey hey, it's okay. You're working a full-time job. Do you know why my mom was able to keep the house the way it was? Because she was a stay-at-home mom. That's a, when you're at home, you're at home. And ultimately, she would love to be a stay-at-home mom, but right now, we're, we're having to both work at the same time, and that's okay. It's just where God has us at the moment. But that's where I look at her, and I see that she loves me so much, she wants to do anything, even if she's working a full-time job. But then I, in turn, say, I love you so much. How about you just give me a call, text me, and say, Honey, can you throw in a load of laundry before you head to work? How about we do this together? How about I love and meet your needs and you love and meet my needs and we'll both do it for the glory of God so that anyone who looks in on this relationship doesn't see us, the sinners, but sees our Lord and Savior who we serve. How about we do that? And that's how we're supposed to be serving. That's what Paul is saying when he's pointing out both. And these things that he's showing here, remember when he points it out, it's because the culture at the time does not do these things. So if they were to have this kind of role and this kind of relationship, it would be different than the world. We are holy, set apart, found faultless and blameless. He tells us that. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Paul lets us know that we were once alienated and hostile and it was expressed through our evil actions. But yet Christ, having died and rose again, makes us holy, faultless and blameless. That holy means set apart. We no longer look like the world. The next relationship that he talks about See, Barbara, that wasn't too bad, was it? I didn't stick it in. There you go. <laughs> I love you guys. The next one that he talks about is the parental relationship. And it's just perfect my mother's here this morning. <sighs> the parental relationship. First he talks to the children and he says what? He says, children, obey your parents in everything. But then... You can't like cut off right there and just go, yeah, but Paul said obey in everything because that's when the parents go in everything. Anything that I've told you to do, you have to do it. You got to lick my shoes because I told you to lick my shoes. You got to do whatever I tell you to do. You got to eat only ham and cheese sandwiches on tortillas the rest of your life because I told you to do that. Hey, <laughs> hey, to be honest, I wouldn't mind that right now. It's actually not too bad. Call that a quesadilla. Um, honey, okay. He, he says in the latter part of that verse, for this pleases the Lord. Obey them in everything. That means everything that is of God. If a parent tells you that you need to go and do something that is a sin, that is against God, do you think that God delights in that? Not at all. Not at all. That's just like when we have governing authorities that tell us to do certain things. God says, listen, respect them, obey them. They're temporary leaders. I'm the one in control and I've placed them there. But do it only if it doesn't cause you to sin or other people to stumble. If it doesn't compromise your faith, go ahead and respect what they've told you to do. Just like here, just like with our governing authorities, here he also says to the children, obey your parents. And now there's two different um, children that we talk about. I'll say it that way. There's two different children that we talk about. We use the term child in terms of maturity sometimes, right? Paul says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. But when I was a man, I became like a man. I acted like a man. So at maturity level, we talk about children. But then we also have uh, biologically or adoptive wise children. So my mom is still my mom. 
and I am still her child, even though I'm 27 years old and she's 30, okay? <laughs> you know what's funny is when you're a little kid, when you first learn how old your parents are, that's the age that you remember. So my mom's always 27 in my mind. You know, I just, I can't do math, so. And she looks it too. But I will always be her child, and if she's been there, done that, already gotten the t-shirt, knows what the word of the Lord says, and she comes to me and says, Austin, listen, I see this in your life right now, and, and my parents, thankfully, I've been blessed with parents who come to me graciously and humbly, and they're very loving, and they say, I see this in your life. God tells us to do this. You, you might want to turn to that, Austin. That, that would be the good thing. If God is leading them to tell me that, I should obey my parents. She's trying to teach me a way to walk in the Lord. That doesn't stop. Now, some of you, you're, you're a little bit older and your children are growing up and you're going, well, I just became a Christian. How am I supposed to tell my kids they're still supposed to obey me? How am I supposed to get that kind of culture into their brain? Start lovingly. Start graciously. Just, hey, I see this and I understand that this will only lead to terrible things in your life and I don't want that for you. That's a caring way to come about it. I don't want this for you. I want you to have life and to have love. Children, some of you have, at this point, you're already grown up, okay? What do you want to be when you grow up? You might have already done it. But you have parents who are in their 70s, 80s, 90s. You have parents in their 60s, and you're going, why should I have to obey my parents still? Just like I said, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. If they've been following the Lord longer than you and they're reading their Bible, God has placed them in that kind of role within the family to continue to help raise you in that way. That's part of the goal, to make you a better follower of Christ. But then at the same time, Paul gives this to the fathers. Now, he doesn't mention mothers. So, moms, you get a break today, I guess. No, it's both of them together. So, fathers, do not exasperate your children. That means don't infuriate. Don't irritate them. Don't pester them. Kids have got to make their own choice. That's why we have a baby dedication, not... I just saved that baby. It's not my choice. It's going to be Edward's choice. And he'll have to choose either God or the world one day. And the reason that we come together and we make that kind of commitment is that Anthony and Kelly before you and the rest of their family, which is good to see you guys, by the way, the rest of their family that's here and the church, we are making that commitment that we are not going to take this word and treat it as the wrong kind of sword. The Bible is the sword, but sometimes people use it to de decapitate one another. Rather than bring it in lovingly and say, this is the weapon of God to fight the world. Here it is for you. Here's what God has for you. I've, I've had this Bible beaten over my head before. Thankfully not by family. My, I've had this Bible taken by people and just right there. Do you think that makes me want to come to know the Lord more? Do you think that discourages me? Where you hear the phrase, you ever heard this phrase before? I want an amen or anything. Raise hand, whatever. Have you ever heard this phrase? You did a good job, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You did a good job, but. And you did a good job is like this big. And the but is like this big because it's got a 50,000 word dissertation on what you need to do for next time. I'm not saying that constructive criticism is bad, but there's a time and place for everything. There are times you have just got to encourage somebody because they're taking those baby steps. You hear people just learning how to share their faith and they come up to you and go, well, I just went, I just told them they need to, they need to turn to Jesus or go to hell. <laughs> Where were you? Middle of Smith's, everyone was there. Just take a second. Good job. You were sharing your faith. You were sharing your faith. Then if they ask, well, what do you think I should do next time? Then we go, okay. <laughs> Let me tell you, let's, let's find some different ways. Or if they say, well, the person spit in my face, what do I do for next time? You, you explain those different ways. But there are times you just need to encourage one another and say, hey, you did good. You're taking those steps. Let's keep going. Let's go in the right direction. We need to be there to encourage and raise children in the ways of the Lord. I'm not a father yet, but I know there's kids in this church that need to hear the word of God. And that's why I had us together as a church take that covenant together. 
we're gonna always teach the word so that little ones like Edward will never be lacking in hearing the word of God and never be lacking in opportunities to come to know the Lord more. The next relationship that Paul talks about in which we're supposed to be reflecting Christ both in word and deed is in labor relationships. And I put this term because, you know, I didn't want to put employer and employee because right here he's talking about masters and slaves. But I do want to kind of give a disclaimer. Back then, masters and slaves were a whole lot different. Slavery was not early American slavery as it was back then, but there were some who treated it that way, who treated their slaves terribly, that slaves never ever could gain freedom whatsoever, just like we were back in America's history. And that's a terrible time in our history. You know, people took these kind of verses and made it sound like God would support something like that, that you can treat a slave like a dog, that you could beat them, starve them, separate them from their families. That is terrible. That should never, ever, ever happen. And I want you to hear that from me from the bottom of my heart so you don't think I'm supporting that kind of thing. What Paul is saying here is that knowing that those kind of things happen, that slavery back in the day, slaves were able to work off their debt and then become free. He said, whether any kind of slavery, any kind of master, anything, slaves, you need to work as though you're working for the Lord. Don't just be that people pleaser where all of a sudden you pick up the pick when somebody walks by or you pick up the rake when somebody walks by and then drop it back down. You take a nine-hour work week. Work as though you're working for the Lord. Do you know if God was standing right here in front of us, let's say he was standing right there, light shining, trumpets blasting from the angels, shouting praises to the Lord, holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty. Most of us right here would drop to our knees, start crying, and say, Lord, forgive me for the way I'm acting right now. Because we don't always act as we're doing everything to the Lord. Some of us might need a new pair of pants, just saying. But if God was standing right here, why is it that we think that God is not here just because we don't see the lights and hear the trumpets? We had a family friend, her name was Bertha who used to tell my siblings when they were kids and they were doing something they shouldn't be, she'd look at them and she'd say, Jesus is watching you. You know the second she said that, what they would do? <laughs> that little number. You straighten up. Pretty much till the day she died, she was reminding us of that, even though we were older. She's saying, Jesus is watching you. That's a reminder for us. And you know, we may not necessarily have slavery right now, but we do have employer and employee. We do have people that we work for or have worked for or are still doing things for the Lord. Are we doing everything possible wholeheartedly for God or are we doing the bare minimum, just skating by? Do you see Christ in people who just like to slop things together? Who do it just to earn a paycheck? or when somebody's happy at their job and they're doing it for a reason and they have a purpose, you really start to see they're working hard for a reason. There's something different about that person. But then Paul gives the same charge to the masters because he says, masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly. Why? Because they too have a master in heaven. We're both serving the Lord, whether master or slave, child or parent, man or wife. We are all serving the Lord for his glory. And so this master, if they're going to treat their slave justly and fairly, that means they're getting paid the wages they need to. They're not getting beaten to death. They're not even getting beaten at all. It shouldn't, shouldn't be happening at all. And it becomes almost not this master and slave, but kind of employer and employee. It becomes this godly work relationship that should be happening and reflecting to everyone. Anyone out there want to work for a mean boss? Okay, that was the perfect time not to say amen. That was, you guys are good. You're catching on to this one. No one wants to, I'll pay you later. No, no one wants to work for a mean boss. In fact, there are some leaders that we have, whether in our government or in our, our uh, employee structure or anything like that. Thankfully, not here at the church. We don't have that kind of thing at this church. Um, but we don't want to follow certain people 
because they think the way the world does and they make decisions based off the world. And we say, but that's not what God has in store for us. I don't wanna be a part of that. And that's why we pray for those people that they may come to know the Lord and live this kind of way. Treat people justly and fairly because they too have a master in heaven. Here's the last relationship that Paul talks about. And we're gonna take some personal application here. He basically says, all you come into contact with. He goes into chapter four, verses five and six, and he says, be wisely in how you act towards outsiders. Take advantage of those opportunities. Let your speech be filled with grace and seasoned with salt. And there's a reason that Paul mentions those kinds of things, and that's where we're gonna kind of take this personal application because if I have been made new and I'm truly living new, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, then that's going to reflect in all of my relationships, no matter what it may be. And I must act wisely. I must let my speech be filled with grace. I must let my word and deed be seasoned with salt. And I must take advantage of the time. So let's first start out with what he says. There's a goal and a purpose purpose of us living this way in all of our relationships, the first thing he says is make most of your time. There's a reason for that. Remember Lee Strobel's story. If you, if you get to this moment, remember Lee Strobel's story. Make most of your time. A random lady from the world's perspective, a random lady from the condo building talked to his wife, Leslie. She made most of her time. There was something about her that she came and talked and either invited her to church, helped to lead her to the Lord, whatever it may be. I'm, I'm, I don't have the full story right here. We don't necessarily have detail step by step. This is what the lady said. But that lady made most of her time and talked with Leslie and said, would you like to come to church with me? And then Leslie, she made most of her time when she went home and talked to Lee. Lee, who, Leslie's right here. Lee is way over here. And that sparked something in him that says, you know, this is winsome and attractive. And I think I want to check that out for myself. Make most of your time because you have no idea what that person's going through. You have no idea how God is working on their heart, what they might have heard. I can't tell you how many times I have stood at this stage right here and preached. And I got down and really I was almost preaching to myself because God had been talking to me all week. And I have about five or six people saying, you must have been talking right to me. How did you know? Man, I'm glad so-and-so wasn't here because, boy, they could have used it. And I'm like, I didn't need to know that. But <laughs> you have no idea how God might be speaking to somebody or speaking through you. Make the most of your time in all of those relationships. The next thing that we see here is let everything, all of your speech, be filled with grace. As you see on the screen, show grace as you've been shown grace. Paul just got done talking to us about that. Forgive others as the Lord Christ has forgiven you. That's not always an easy thing to do. Grace is that thing that is given to somebody when they don't deserve it. And so everything that we say has to be something that goes above and beyond what they actually deserve. You know, as a sinner, what I deserve is death. And instead, God gave me Jesus and life. And so in that same manner, when people try and say things to you like, why are you a Christian? That's so stupid. You're so foolish. Why do you act this way? Why do you help this person when you know for a fact they've done this to you? And blah, 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 blah. And they, I mean, just blah, blah, blah. They could go on and on and on. You could write a book of the kind of criticisms that people give you. And you could also write a book in your flesh of the things that would be gotcha phrases. Oh, I'll just tell them this. I'll do this. They want to treat me that way. I'll treat them this way. I'll be done with them. They're dead to me. That is not filled with grace whatsoever. What that person deserves, yeah, that person just like you deserves death, but has been given an opportunity through grace because of Jesus Christ. So let your words be filled with grace. Give them what they don't deserve, and that speaks Christ all the more to them. I've had friends call me stupid. I've had friends call me crazy. I've had friends call me things I can't even say in front of you because I was a Christian. But instead of saying, Dad, no way, you're a, I'm a, I could go on and on. Instead of that, I go, well, you know what? God still loves you. The door's still open. You can come back anytime you want. And that spoke more to that person than anything else I could have ever said because of Jesus. 
The last thing that we see there, word and deed seasoned with salt. Paul uses that kind of terminology because back then the, the Greek uh, salty language was like witty language. It's not like salty language like what we think of now. Um, where you're hoping you have the V chip in your TV so it blanks that stuff out. But salty language was like witty language. The things that were, that were quick do you kind of understand where I'm going with that? But he doesn't mention it just for that. When you think of things in terms of salt, and I'm a food guy, clearly, um, salt preserves things, correct? That's what people use all the time. We used to smoke salmon all the time, and part of the mixture was sugar and salt. Salt is the one that held it together. Uh, when we go to make beef jerky, salt is the thing that holds it together. When you go to eat watermelon, salt is the thing that makes it taste good. Um, you guys didn't get that part, but you may not agree. Get out of here. But salt is the thing that preserves things. And so what Paul is trying to say in part is that seasoned with salt means that you're going to preserve the message. Don't stray away from what the gospel has. Don't stray away from the word of God. Stick to the word of God. You can offer them nothing except for Christ. Try and offer them your love, you're gonna fail them. Try and offer them somebody else's love or a coping mechanism or whatever it may be aside from Christ, it will fail them. The only thing that's going to be preserved and everlasting is the word of God. So stick to it. But he also, in part, he's saying preserve it, but he's also saying that salt gives a different taste than that of the world. You ever add salt to something or you taste something? My wife makes salsa. And there are some times that she'll have me come over to the blender if she, after she's roasted everything and killed me with heat. Um, she'll have me come over and taste it real quick with a chip. And I'll go, oh, it needs salt. It needs salt. Because you can taste it, right? There's a difference between a salty and unsalty. Or there's times I go, oh, would you pour the whole cup in there? What did you? Normally she gets it just perfect and I don't have to do that or anything. And, and sometimes it's her doing that where she's making funny faces in the kitchen and I know either it's no salt or she needs salt, whatever it may be. But salt gives a different taste. Just like in our lives, if I'm going to reflect Christ, it's going to give a different taste than that of the world. Think and remember of those words from his story. When his wife started acting different than that of the world and what she used to do, it was winsome and attractive. It was something that he wanted to be a part of, something that he could taste and say, that is beautiful, I love it. I hope that this is a challenge for you because it's a challenge for me to reflect on, on my own life, look at all my relationships and say, do I always reflect Christ in this? If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, after we take a time of remembrance to see what he's done, we're gonna have a time of response. And I want you to know, I'm gonna be right here to pray with you. I hope that you have seen something winsome and attractive, that there is life, there is love, and it is only found in Christ. And I don't want you to go one more day without it. You.